Good afternoon. I'm Lee O'Connor. It's my pleasure to be with you here today. You who clearly are the leaders of the next generation. And I noticed that that's actually the, uh, one of the, part of the titles of the, of the conference. I was privileged to serve as the head of the Justice Department's tax division during most of the administration of George W. Bush. Since then, I've been a partner with Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman. My office is in Washington, D.C. A world without war. What a concept. Sadly, with the exception of brief respites, there's almost always a war of some sort going on somewhere. My father's father served in the Navy during World War I. My father served in the United States Army in World War II. And when he was probably about the age of the students in here, he led a platoon of American soldiers into combat in Europe. A few years later, he was deployed behind enemy lines during the Korean War. Two of my three brothers were Marines during the Vietnam War. They were never deployed to Vietnam, but many of my friends from high school were. They were engaged in fighting to keep communists from taking over South Vietnam. In previous battles, countries made official declarations of war against each other. They put their men in uniform and faced them off against each other. Not always, but that's generally how it worked. Today we have something people call the war on terror. I object to that term because it sounds as though it's a war we declared, but it is not. It is our determination upon which we act that those who would destroy us and destroy our way of life will be deprived of the ways and means of doing so. A few months after I took office at the Justice Department, terrorists commandeered passenger planes and threw them into the World Trade Center towers, the Pentagon, and thanks to the bravery, strength, and determination of passengers into a field in Pennsylvania instead of another of the terrorists' targets. My friend Barbara Olson was on the plane flown into the Pentagon. A few months earlier, when I learned President Bush would appoint me to head the tax division, Barbara was the second call I made after the one to my husband. That sparkling moment in September 2001, Barbara's husband, Ted, was on the phone in his office directly above mine, one floor up, saying his final goodbyes. These students were in, what, the sixth grade then. It happened a long time ago in your lifetime, but, but not in mine. The war in which we're now engaged has different challenges than those of my fathers and brothers. Our panelists today have had hands-on experience with and have devoted serious scholarly consideration to one of the tools being deployed in that war. It is my pleasure to introduce them to you. Each will devote about 15 minutes to an opening statement after which they will engage each other and then we will take questions from the floor. And yes, it really is hot in here. And if my face is red, it's not because I'm embarrassed, it's because I'm hot. So I have uh, not asked permission to do this, but I think it's appropriate that those of you who are able to do so, if you would like to, loosen your ties, take off your jackets. We all thought it was a good idea to come to Florida in March, didn't we? Well, this is, this is what you get. Our first speaker today, and they're going to speak from the order of farthest from me to closest, is Greg Katsis. Greg is currently a partner with the Washington, D.C. office of Jones Day. He served for many years and in many capacities, senior capacities, in the United States Justice Department and was my colleague there. He was head of the Civil Division. He became acting Associate Attorney General. He was actively involved in defending Bush administration policies on the war on terror when challenged in court. Earlier in his career, he clerked for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Martin Flaherty is the Leitner Family Professor of Law and co-founding director of the Leitner Center for International Law and Justice at Fordham Law School. He's also a visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Affairs. He served as a law clerk for Justice Byron White of the United States Supreme Court. And he has led or participated in human rights missions to Northern Ireland, Turkey, Hong Kong, Mexico, Malaysia, Kenya, and Romania. Our next speaker is Michael, next speaker is Michael Stokes Paulson. He is Distinguished University Chair and Professor of Law at the University of St. Thomas, where he has taught since 
2007. For the 16 preceding years, he was a professor and associate dean at the University of Minnesota Law School. Pardon me, but I, they must have the heat on in here. I am so parched. That's a Rubio moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Paulson is author of more than 90 scholarly articles and book chapters on a wide variety of constitutional law topics. I would particularly like to call your attention to this one, now out in paperback, published by the Federalist Society. If you don't already have it, I highly recommend it to you. I bought it in hardback. It is Our Constitution, Landmark Interpretations of America's Governing Document, and it summarizes important Supreme Court decisions over the course of years which have dictated much of what came after them. Our final speaker today will be Rosa Brooks. She is a professor at the Georgetown University Law Center where she teaches courses on international law, national security, constitutional law, and other subjects. She also writes a weekly column for foreign policy and serves as a Swartz Senior Fellow at the New America Foundation. She recently served for two years as Counselor to the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. She's an author and world-traveling researcher, former Special Counsel to the President of the Open Society Institute, and previously taught human rights, constitution, and criminal law at the University of Virginia. Our panelists, after each makes about 15 minutes of open remarks, opening remarks, will engage each other, and then we will invite you to engage with them. Please welcome our first panelist, Greg Katsas. Thank you very much. Um, so the topic as formulated is the use of drones for targeted killing of suspected terrorists. Um, I'd like to just assume for the moment that by suspected terrorists, we really mean suspected Al-Qaeda terrorists and slightly reframe the question as when is it appropriate to use drones uh, for targeted killing of Al-Qaeda terrorists. Um, that raises a set of very difficult policy questions, which I won't really address, decisions like um, when do you try to kill the enemy as opposed to capture them, um, when are the costs, the, the diplomatic costs um, of a mission like a drone thing, you know, when do those outweigh the benefit of taking out a terrorist? Um, that's not really my area of expertise. Um, I'm going to focus on the legal questions um, regarding drone use. Um, and I think the basic legal question um, about permissibility of drone use um, is actually a very easy question. Um, and it's one that has um, essentially nothing to do with either um, drones, quad drones, um, or the concept of targeted killing as such. Um, and it's a question that has everything to do um, with um, the, the prior background question of whether the United States is engaged in an armed conflict with Al Qaeda. Why do I think that's the fundamental question? Well, in armed conflict, of course, um, one can use lethal force against the forces of the enemy, and, the dr and drones are simply one means of delivering lethal force. If the United States is in an armed conflict with Nazi Germany in World War II, we can send our planes to go drop bombs on German, uh, German forces. That's not a controversial proposition. That is what countries do in war. Um, and exactly the same legal justification would, uh, would apply to al-Qaeda operatives if, but only if, uh, the United States is engaged in a, an armed conflict with al-Qaeda. I take that to be the fundamental question um, that we should talk about. Um, the most important, one of the most important, if the not uh, most important decisions in the Bush administration was to treat the 9-11 attacks um, as acts of war, not simply crimes calling for a law enforcement response, um, but acts of war calling for a military response. And so the president didn't simply dispatch the FBI to gather evidence of crimes for prosecution. He dispatched the United States military uh, to go after the people who had attacked us. Um, and that fundamental decision to treat um, the Al-Qaeda attacks um, 
as an act of war, I, I think is what drives all of the questions that we uh, were talking about on this panel that were addressed in the last panel regarding military detention, military commission prosecutions, treatment of detainees, um, and as most specific to this panel, um, use of lethal force uh, through drones or otherwise. Um, the, that basic decision by the Bush administration was perhaps controversial for a while. Um, there were people who argued that armed conflict is something that can occur only between um, sovereign nations or at most between um, rival um, claimants of, of sovereignty in something like a civil war, but not something that can occur between a sovereign nation and um, a private non-state group um, like Al-Qaeda. Um, th that view um, simply has not prevailed. Um, the United States Congress, um, supporting President Bush, passed the AUMF, um, which authorizes military force against nations, organizations, or persons who committed the attacks or harbored those who did. That self-evidently encompasses the, the non-state group of Al-Qaeda, which was the organization as opposed to the nation that committed the 9-11 attacks. Um, and the Supreme Court in the Hamdan case in 2006, um, through its support behind this, this worldview, um, in applying a law of war framework to questions regarding the um, prosecution and treatment um, of an Al-Qaeda operative. Uh, and finally, President Obama, notwithstanding some of his um, campaign rhetoric against the Bush administration policies, when he became commander in chief, embraced the law of war paradigm um, wholesale. So I, I think now 12 years into the armed conflict with Al-Qaeda, with every branch of the United States government having uh, bought off on this and presidents of both parties, I, I think the, the basic question, can we use lethal military force against Al-Qaeda, are we in an armed conflict with them, um, is settled and the debates are on that score are only of historic interest. Um, I said use of drones, quad drones, doesn't strike me as a distinctive or interesting question. Um, drones are simply a, a means for delivering lethal force. That's what we do in war. The, di the only difference between a drone and a conventional airplane is that you can deliver the bomb um, in, if you use a drone with much less risk to your own forces. You don't need a pilot who can be shot down. And there's certainly no law of war principle that says you have to use a more risky method of attacking enemy forces as opposed to a less risky method. Um, I also said I, I don't think the idea of targeted killing raises any serious concerns. Um, what's the alternative to targeted killing? It's indiscriminate killing, and that's what is the problem in international law. Targeted killing is not merely permitted, but is required, at least in the sense that you have to target um, enemy forces as opposed to neutrals and civilians and such. Um, and then there's the further idea of sort of targeting specific individuals within the force. Um, there's, no, um, there's no principle that, you know, if you have one bullet left in your um, rifle, you have to sort of randomly pick the target. You can't pick the general as opposed to the private. Um, or similarly, if you, know, if you think the operation that took out Osama bin Laden was lawful, even though he was, he was quite obviously specifically targeted as an individual, it was lawful because it was done through traditional boots on the ground, send in the military. It wouldn't become unlawful if he had been targeted um, um, through use of a plane, a conventional plane or a drone as opposed to boots on the ground. Um, I do think there are a series of other interesting questions uh, regarding the scope of um, uh, drone authority, and I'd like to just lay out uh, four or five of those, um, and I'd like to give you a sense of how we um, had addressed those questions in the Bush administration, how the Obama administration has addressed some of these questions, and do a little bit of a compare and contrast, um, which to me is quite interesting. Uh, so the first question is, who can be targeted? Um, I, I started by defining the problem in terms of al-Qaeda. 
Um, the, the core al-Qaeda fighters are the easy case, um, nations, organizations, or persons who committed the 9-11 attacks. Um, there are a series of harder questions um, kind of at the margins. Um, they tend to come up in two ways. One is when you talk, um, when you think about groups that um, may be affiliated with al-Qaeda to one degree or another, there are a series of questions about what counts or doesn't count as an associated force. You know, is al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula close enough? Is Hezbollah close enough? Um, there are a series of tough questions there. And then there are a series of tough questions when you talk about not simply the combatants, but the supporters. Um, in the Bush administration, we took the position that um, associated forces would be fair game for targeting, as would supporters. The Obama administration has continued that pos both aspects of that position um, uh, uh, as we have. Um, I think it's on the margins just because every, every at least known case of a drone killing has involved al-Qaeda members as opposed to, or at least al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which seems reasonably close, as opposed to groups that look far afield or support, you know, people who just write checks or, or provide limited support in that sense. Um, the other interesting who question is, um, can you target citizens? Um, I actually think that's pretty easy. The Supreme Court in the World War II case of Kieran and in the post-2011 case of Hamdi said, of course, if a, if a citizen joins a hostile group, he doesn't um, gain an immunity from being targeted. Um, and we took that position successfully, and the o Obama administration has continued it. The next set of interesting questions are, are the where questions. Um, where can the president deploy lethal force through drones or otherwise? Um, we took the position there were no geographic limits. Um, there are none in the AUMF. Um, there really aren't any in traditional practice. One can follow the enemy forces where they are. That's why. We, um, the United States dispatched General Patton in World War II into North Africa without a declaration of war against North African countries because that's where the German forces were. And in particular, you think about how terrorist groups operate. They don't mass on a traditional battlefield. Um, and Al-Qaeda, in a very real, literal sense, uh, made Lower Manhattan and Northern Virginia and Shanksville, Pennsylvania into battlefields on September 11 uh, itself. Um, the Obama administration, specifically in the context of addressing drones in a 2011 white paper that DOJ prepared on this subject, um, took the same position and said uh, no geographic limitations. Now this raises a, a a tough extreme case, which is, well, can the president use drones inside the U.S.? And everyone's natural instinct is to recoil against that and think, gee, that would be really awful. Um, I think the reason we have that reaction is that we have been blessed um, to have had no real armed conflict on American soil in 150 years since probably the Civil War. But if you imagine, God forbid, that there should be a real armed conflict on American soil, would it conceivably make sense to say that the one place in which the president is disabled from using lethal force is the one place where the terrorists or the fighters would be most dangerous, which is um, uh, in the American heartland? Um, that can't be right. And the Obama administration, they've, take, they've walked a fine line on this. They have said that drones should not be used in the U.S., which seems perfectly reasonable conclusion under current conditions as a policy matter, but they've never quite brought themselves to say that drones can't be used in the U.S., which I, I think any, um, any sensible Justice Department would have to preserve at, at least the option for use of military force in this country um, if needed. Okay, next question. Under what conditions could drones be used? The administration in their white paper um, set out a three-part test that sounds very nice and measured and, you know, here are all the factors. But when you read the fine print, it turns out to be n not limiting at all. First of all, they frame the test as a series of sufficient conditions to justify use of a drone attack. They don't say that they are necessary conditions. And when you look at the conditions, none of them is really constraining at all. 
So the first part of their test is to say um, you need the terrorist has to be um, an imminent threat as determined and um, by an informed U.S. official. So there's a concept of imminence embedded in there. That sounds like it might be a significant limitation, but when you read their analysis, um, they really basically say imminent doesn't mean imminent. Um, they say um, that involvement with Al Qaeda um, uh, would support a determination of imminence. So they're really, they're not, um, they use the word imminent, but it's not a conduct-based concept sort of key to a self-defense idea. It's really a status-based concept. The idea is if, if you're a member of the Al-Qaeda forces, uh, you're a fair game, and they use the word imminent to label that conclusion. Um, the other idea they have is, well, there has to be an informed determination um, that you, in fact, are a member of Al-Qaeda rather than a, a someone wrongly um, th uh, thought to be that way. There's sort of implicit in that idea is some notion of adjudicatory procedure to figure out who really are the bad guys, um, but they don't have any elaboration on kind of what the executive has to do um, in order to make the determination and what process um, they have to follow. They just simply say, well, if the determination is informed, good enough. Um, their second criteria is um, that capture has to be infeasible. And again, that, you know, that sounds superficially like it might be a constraining consideration, um, but consider President Obama's counterterrorism speech May 13, 2013, a major speech he gave. He's talking about um, the problem of going after terrorists who are hiding in caves or compounds in countries like Yemen or Pakistan. And he says, the kind of operation, the boots on the ground operation, which is what you would have to do um, in order to affect the alternative of capture, the alternative to killing of capture, he says is as a general matter um, infeasible. Too great a risk to US forces, more risk of collateral damage to bystanders, and a greater risk of inflaming local countries when the uh, the troops have to be there and march in and be there in a more regular, extended way than through a surgical drone strike. So there you have kind of um, the administration's own explanation that um, the infeasibility criterion will be satisfied, at least where we're talking about terrorists in countries like Yemen uh, and um, Pakistan, the focus of many of these operations. Um, and the, their third criterion is that the strikes have to be consistent with international law, and that picks up ideas of not targeting civilians and not having disproportionate um, casualties and so on. Um, that's, not so, that's not a constraint um, uh, on um, the, the international law framework. That's just a reaffirmation that the United States uh, follows the law, laws of war. Um, doesn't seem to provide any further constraint beyond uncontroversial propositions that um, are widely accepted. Um, next issue, um, whether and to what extent um, federal constitutional protections like the Fifth Amendment apply. Um, in the Bush administration, we face these questions in the context of use of military force to detain. We didn't have any drone cases, but um, same idea, and we took, the, we took the position that the Fifth Amendment um, doesn't apply at all to aliens held outside the country, um, and that even where the Fifth Amendment does apply, like to the detention of U.S. citizens, they get fundamentally um, less process uh, because um, these are wartime decisions as opposed to something else. The driving consideration in our analysis was that war is different. Um, the Obama administration um, has analyzed this question in the specific context of lethal force through drones. Um, they take the position that the Fifth Amendment, um, or they assume at least that the Fifth Amendment applies, and they start their analysis with this very soothing, um, traditional, non-warlike um, consideration of the three-factor balancing test of Matthews versus Eldridge. And you sort of think, well, this is 
just kind of like the question whether social security benefits can be taken away and it all just sounds so normal. Um, but again, when you read the fine print, um, what they say is that the, the balancing test will always be satisfied whenever their three-part test that I laid out a minute ago is satisfied. So if I'm right that their, their three-part test really does nothing except say we're going to follow, uh, we're going to follow the, the laws of war, um, the Fifth Amendment overlay really does nothing um, besides say we're going to follow um, the laws of war. Um, their analysis is cosmetically different from what we would have done, um, but I don't think it is substantively different in the least. Um, and the final question I'll put on the table is the question of judicial review. This is a little bit different from the question whether the Constitution applies. This is the question whether a party can go to, uh, can ask a court to make that determinate a determination under the Constitution or some other source of law. Um, in the Bush administration, we faced howls of protest um, when we tried to cut off judicial review in military detention cases. Um, the Guantanamo Bay detention case is one example. Um, another case I worked on where we successfully invoked the state secrets privilege to prevent a German national from challenging his alleged detention um, in what he said was a, a CIA secret prison. Um, the Obama administration has now um, has had to face the question of judicial review um, in the specific context of drones. Um, this came up in a case called Al Alaki. Mr. Al Alaki is to date the only citizen, U.S. citizen, um, who's been killed in a drone attack. Um, he was a, an Al Qaeda leader plotting attacks on the U.S. in the Arabian Peninsula, I think in Yemen. Um, it was leaked before he was killed that he had been put on the kill list and his father sued in district court in Washington and invoked, um, uh, sought judicial review of that decision and said, you know, you, you can't allow the government to um, kill my son without any process. Um, and the administration made a, a narrow standing argument, perfectly good to the facts of that case, saying, well, the father would have next friend standing only if the son were unavailable to come into court. And um, being a fugitive hiding in caves plotting attacks against Americans doesn't count as being unavailable if al Alaki wants to come into court and, and um, say, please don't kill me. He's perfectly free to do that, um, but he chose not to. Um, but they didn't stop at that kind of narrow, fact-specific argument. They made the two um, very sweeping arguments just like the ones we had made. Um, they argued that the president's targeting decisions, even when directed against an American citizen and even when they involve the use of lethal force, um, are not judicially reviewable under the political question doctrine and they independently invoked the state secrets privilege to argue that the case could not be litigated without putting state secrets in danger. Um, just to give you a sense of how broad and forceful those arguments um, were, I'll just read a, a quick passage from their brief just to give you a flavor of it. Um, in particular, plaintiffs requested relief, which is judicial review of the, tar the targeting decision against al um, would put at issue the lawfulness of the future use of force overseas that executive officials might undertake at the direction of the president against a foreign organization as to which the political branches have authorized the use of all necessary and appropriate force. Specific decisions regarding the use of force frequently must be made in the midst of crisis situations that can arise at any time and that involve the delicate balancing of short and long-term security, foreign policy, and intelligence equities. The judiciary is simply not equipped to manage the president and his national security advisors in their discharge of these most critical and sensitive executive functions and prescribe ex ante whether, where, or in what circumstances such decisions would be lawful. Whatever the limits of the political question doctrine, this case is at its core. Now, I have a couple of reactions to this. One, I have to admit, as a um, 
former official of the Bush administration, which was pilloried over um, things much less aggressive than this. I'm a little galled by the double standard in the court of public opinion. I mean, imagine if we had filed a brief like this. Um, but I have to say, as the official who would have um, had to sign the al brief um, had the al case arisen in the Justice Department, I, my reaction is I, I just I have to um, take my hat off to them and congratulate them for um, their very vigorous and persuasive defense of the president's power to uh, protect the country um, in the ongoing armed conflict. Thank you. Please welcome Professor Flaherty. Um, thank you, Eileen. Uh, it's not often you see uh, Irish people in uh, March drinking water at this hour of the day, but that's how hot it is up here. And, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, the um, University of Florida chapter of the Federalist Society for putting on a magnificent uh, gathering. I think it's appropriate to say at the end of the session. And also to the Federal Society, uh, however much I may disagree with the tenets of uh, some of your most uh, famous and eminent uh, speakers and scholars, I am always stimulated uh, and always uh, 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 benefit from the engagement of uh, coming to uh, events such as this. And I um, am always delighted when I'm asked uh, to participate. Um, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about two things and then concentrate on uh, one larger thing, or at least focus my remarks on uh, a third thing uh, with regard to this topic. Uh, the uh, two things I want to touch on briefly are, first, the need for greater transparency uh, in the whole issue of uh, targeted killing and drones uh, with regard to both uh, available facts and uh, legal standards. Um, and I think that's something in which there will be more or less general agreement. Second, I want to at least briefly mention uh, um, some points about uh, international law concerning uh, uh, targeted killings and drones. And, but I want to uh, focus the balance of my remarks on uh, constitutional concerns that arise from targeted killing uh, through drones and also methods to address those concerns. So let me first start with uh, uh, the two smaller points, at least uh, for the purposes of my talks. One is uh, transparency, and the problem is, um, uh, and here, you know, I will, I, I criticize the Bush administration, but I am also going to criticize the Obama administration on the point of transparency, both with regard to information concerning drones and drone strikes, as well as the legal basis for them. Um, as far as we know, the stats are something like this, and these are stats um, compiled by uh, NGOs, compiled actually by some law school-based human rights programs, et cetera. Um, but there have been 300-plus drone strikes um, since the uh, advent of the Obama administration, and something like 3,500 people killed in those drone strikes, with something like 300 to 400 civilian deaths. Now, the something like is uh, my point, because we really don't uh, know exactly uh, what these uh, figures are, and it's very hard to proceed on uh, either a policy discussion concerning drones or even uh, a legal discussion, given uh, the extent to which one needs to apply the law to the facts uh, in this situation. Um, likewise with the law. We do have that brief leaked memo, 16-page memo, apparently um, drawn up by uh, uh, Marty Lederman and David Barron, which itself is a summary of a 50-page memo, apparently. Um, and we also have speeches from the former legal advisor uh, at the State Department, Harold Coe, and also John Brennan, giving us some idea of what the Obama administration's position is with regard to uh, um, the legal basis for drones. But as Greg's remarks focus, um, the uh, analysis is very thin. Um, and uh, I think that as a matter of due process, as a matter of uh, freedom of information, 
you know, the American public and, you know, our allies are entitled to know what the legal basis is for using the quite extraordinary power of targeting someone for, um, uh, for death uh, through whatever means. And in this, there is not a left-right split. Um, people who agree with me on this point are people like Jack Goldsmith and John Bellinger. Um, both of whom were prominent officials uh, in the former Bush administration and who I believe are, you know, regular participants at Federalist Society events. So um, I think uh, the uh, current administration uh, uh, should be castigated for not being more uh, uh, forthcoming with information both as to statistics and as to uh, the law. The other thing I want to touch on briefly is uh, the international law uh, uh, aspects of this. Now, as has been stated, if we are using drones against uh, uh, a sovereign nation or indeed on a hot battlefield, they are entirely appropriate. I don't think there's anyone who argues that drones as a weapon system is any uh, worse and indeed is very much better than a lot of older weapon systems like uh, you know, aerial bombing. Where um, uh, international law uh, uh, has more of a bite is precisely in the situation of targeting folks who are outside of the hot battlefields, of classical battlefields. So members of al-Qaeda or associated forces in places like Yemen. Um, there, the framework um, that is generally applied, although our allies don't apply it, but we apply it and I can, you know, I don't radically disagree with applying this, is a common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which applies to um, conflicts not of an international nature, which this would fall under. Um, now, what also applies are some of the classic, what's known as use in bello constraints with regard to how you fight a war, which are contained in the customs of war as well as the Geneva Conventions, including the um, protocols that uh, followed them. And there, um, the classic constraints, and this is something that uh, the administration concedes uh, is, is uh, applicable for the use of drones once you decide, uh, after you've targeted someone, are the four cardinal principles of you can kill someone uh, if there's military necessity, if the means you used are proportional, if there are reasonable efforts to discriminate against, um, uh, between civilians and uh, combatants, uh, whether lawful or not, I'm using sort of some of the sloppier words, and whether the means you use are humane, in, in other words, they don't use or create inordinate suffering. Um, and by those um, uh, criteria, and I believe Rose is going to speak more on this, but on those criteria, you know, drones are, you know, do not clearly violate those criteria. In fact, you know, in many ways they represent a step forward from at least some of the classic weapon systems used uh, during World War II, which is not to say that international law cannot uh, improve in that regard or that they are wise to use to the extent they've been used on a policy level, but I'm just talking about the law. Now let me move to the uh, 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 focus of my remarks, which is constitutional concerns and uh, possible safeguards for those concerns. And here, uh, much to my surprise in preparing for uh, this talk, uh, imagine my surprise when I saw that someone who seemed to at least be uh, uh, a partial ally of mine was none other than the former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez, who wrote a pretty significant and interesting article in a recent um, uh, number of the George Washington Law Review, where he talks about drones and constraint, both constitutional constraints and safeguards to uh, address those constraints. Um, he spends most of his time actually arguing for uh, the applicability of the Constitution outside of the classic hot battlefield um, area, so uh, precisely to places like Yemen. To a lesser extent, but also significantly, he talks about additional safeguards beyond what at least what we think we know the administration uh, uh, currently provides with regard to targeting decisions. Um, an interesting follow-up to that, um, I'm a law professor, so I have to kind of load you up with additional reading, is a response by um, uh, uh, Steve Vladek at American uh, uh, University, who actually agrees with much of Gonzalez's analysis, but takes it further. 
He agrees that there are constitutional constraints uh, uh, in this uh, regard, but he also um, thinks that the safeguards that uh, uh, Attorney General Gonzalez um, uh, proposes are insufficient. And he actually proposes more, uh, actually judicial scrutiny outside of the uh, executive branch. I'll talk a little bit more about these uh, later uh, in my remarks. But, you know, since I feel my mission is to give you value for money, I'm going to take things still further, just to be provocative, and argue that uh, my concerns, uh, constitutional concerns, are broader than uh, those of those two authors. And um, uh, also I would have, uh, I will propose more thoroughgoing judicial uh, constraints. So first, with regard to the Constitution. What is the candidate for constitutional concerns? It is uh, the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be uh, denied of life, liberty, property without due process of law. Now, if we had more time, I would go into more the distinction between hot and um, uh, hot battlefield and outside the hot battlefield. No one, uh, at least very few, if anyone, is going to argue that due process constrains the military in a war or on a hot battlefield. The argument, however, is that um, due pro outside of the hot battlefield, that's where due process concerns arise. Because if they don't, consider the alternative. If they don't, if the war on terrorism is everywhere, if Manhattan, where I live, is still a battlefield, then that means that constitutional constraints do not bind the president, and the president could target someone for execution after having determined they are associated with al-Qaeda and assassinate them on the streets of Manhattan. You know. um, why not? So I think that both international law and constitutional law both do and are well advised to make this distinction. Now, given that distinction, um, here uh, actually is my most provocative point, and here I get uh, in trouble with even some of my more liberal friends, which is um, it is unclear to me, and I actually would welcome questions during the Q&A uh, um, clarifying this for me, it is unclear to me why the due process clause is limited even in the situation of targeting um, uh, un unlawful combatants outside the territory of the United States but not on a hot battlefield, why that's limited to citizens. Right? We like text, don't we? That's you know, Justice Scalia and others. It says no person shall be denied life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It doesn't say citizen. Um, Structurally, the 14th Amendment picks up on exactly that distinction. It says, it, it, the 14th Amendment says in its due process clause, it says person after having earlier distinguished a more fulsome body of rights for citizens. Um, now, there are a number of practices and cases from that go to early in our history. My colleague Andrew Kent at Fordham has written about some of them that indicate that actually non-citizen non combatants were not uh, extended constitutional uh, uh, protections early in our history. But I would submit, and this would be a much more complicated discussion, I would submit that those examples are too few and far between, and that a much better reading of our constitutional tradition is precisely that as a, a, a government that is created by a constitution of limited enumerated powers, wherever those powers are asserted, so too should the constraints on those powers go, at least when it comes to fundamental due process with the regard of taking a life, uh, again, outside of war battlefield situation. So that's my big provocative uh, point uh, on that. Now, and, and by the way, I should say that in one sense when we were talking about targeting citizens and their due process protections, we're talking about almost no one. Um, I think, Greg, there are actually two or three citizens who have been killed by, I think Alawaki's son was, was killed who was a citizen. Um, but, you know, if we're yeah, the numbers are 300 to 400 um, uh, civilians being killed. It will be rare, you know, we're not talking about, it's a lot of uh, wasted breath, uh, not wasted breath, but it's a lot of um, uh, writing and a lot of analysis for a surpassingly small group if what we're talking about are citizens outside our borders. Okay, so let me move on beyond that and talk about the constitutional um, standard. Uh, 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 that would be uh, applied. 
And the constitutional or, or the agreement about the extraterritorial application of the due process clause to, uh, um, to at least two citizens, um, but more generally is, you know, Hamdi talked, at least with regard to citizens, Hamdi in the context of detention would apply it extraterritorially to uh, citizens. Um, the Obama uh, white paper that Greg talks about also concedes that due process uh, is a uh, constraint. So too does Attorney General Gonzalez. He um, also believes that uh, outside of the battlefield context, and I mean the real battlefield context, not Manhattan, at least not Manhattan today, um, due process uh, also applies, as does you know, my friends in the ACS. So there is a range of different actors who do not find this idea uh, revolutionary or um, uh, uh, radical. Now, what is exactly the due process standard we're talking about? Well, also, as Greg mentioned, the due process standard that we're talking about is Matthews versus Eldridge, which is odd because it is a standard developed for Social Security benefits and that sort of thing. It's used in CivPro and Connecticut v. Door for all sorts of mundane things. But it was picked up by Justice O'Connor in uh, the Hamdi case. And, you know, for want of anything better, it at least gives a, uh, 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 a standard that has jurisprudence and it gives some guidance and provides at least some constraints that are indeed flexible, which should be considered one of its virtues with regard to this particular issue. Now, what are the classic Matthews versus Eldridge um, uh, uh, standards? It's a three-part inquiry. What is the government, what is the interest of the rights claimant? What is the interest of the government? And then it requires a balance of the cost of additional safeguards uh, versus uh, to, to um, prevent the risk of erroneous deprivation. All right, well, how, does that, how would that work with regard to uh, targeted killing of um, uh, not at citizens at least, and I would argue as a footnote, uh, non-citizens as well, um, outside the battlefield in places like Yemen or Toronto or, you know, Brooklyn? Um, now, what I would argue is, and I think the first two prongs of the analysis are rather obvious, there is no more important uh, constitutional interest uh, in terms of rights than life. Uh, conversely, there are fewer more important governmental interests than protecting the innocent lives of American citizens and preserving national security. So you have very high uh, weighty values on both sides. So the real devil is in the details of balancing. Now, uh, just to make clear what I am not talking about, under this analysis, Exigent circumstances, and this is true even in mundane areas like prejudgment attachment. Um, in exigent circumstances under the Matthews test, everything is relaxed. And so what we're not talking about here are, you know, decisions where a, uh, uh, someone you see engaging in terrorism in Yemen is about to do something. Can, do you have to worry about the due process, you know, due process uh, uh, mechanisms there? No even under the application of this test. That is not what we're talking about, okay? What we're talking about and what I'm talking about actually is what the practice is for at least as best as we can understand it, almost all of those who have been targeted with drones, which is they have been targeted by being placed on a kill list substantially in advance, and I think the government indication is at least 24 hours before um, the operation has been conducted, and often months and months before that, as the Alawaki case indicates. All right, that's what we're talking about, which actually happens to be most of the targeted killing we're talking about. All right, well, what are the possible mechanisms for ensuring that you are not getting the wrong person, that you are not erroneously depriving someone of their life? Um, uh, in the interests of national security. Well, the Obama administration, uh, uh, and I won't repeat it, ha has what I agree are the very thin safeguards that uh, the White House white paper uh, outlines. Um, the one thing I would add, though, is the white paper itself is very thin from what we know 
the uh, uh, actual procedures are pretty thick. Something like 100 or so national security, uh, uh, folks from the national security uh, establishment are involved in uh, vetting of targets. So there is a substantial internal checks that the executive branch uses in effect, even though the administration is saying that that's not required, that's actually what the administration does. Um, so that's at least some sort of uh, comfort in that regard. Nonetheless, one can argue that that is still insufficient. Um, another option to ensure that someone's life is not erroneously deprived uh, by being erroneously placed on a target list would be what Attorney General Gonzalez recommends, which is a version of the CSRTs, a version of the Combat Status Review Tribunals. He proposes creating something, uh, a, a, a panel essentially within the executive branch, within the military, that would serve as a neutral arbiter, a neutral body, which he argues would address some of the current due process deficiencies in the current system, even the one uh, uh, that appears to take place uh, in actuality. Um, my colleague uh, Steve Vladek argues for something like a FISA court. If you were going to put somebody on a surveillance list and you have to go to a, a court that Congress has established for that purpose, it would seem to follow if you're going to put someone on a list uh, that uh, will result in the deprivation of their life, that, that would be a stronger argument. Vladek uh, uh, makes that argument, although he curiously doesn't have the courage of his convictions and says it should only be uh, an ex post procedure. So only if you have been killed or injured should your family or uh, uh, you know, next of kin, or if you've been injured, you, should you be able to bring a damages action uh, 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 on the grounds that you were in fact erroneously targeted. Um, I would go just the one step further and say that um, given especially what, uh, oh, okay, thanks, given especially what um, the uh, government does already, which is substantial vetting, it would not be a substantial additional burden on government practice to go before something like a FISA court to ensure that um, the targeting is accurate before a neutral body um, and that there would still be some value added by having to go before the neutral body. Now, I don't have time to refute, uh, you know, the objections I can anticipate. The only one objection I would uh, sort of proactively or preemptively uh, um, uh, address is the one that this is in the business of the courts. Well, this is precisely what the business of the court should be. What we're not talking about is the actual decision to take some, someone out or how to take someone out. That may or may not be subject to political question doctrine. Here again, we're just talking about putting someone on the list and whether there's sufficient evidence to show that they are a member of Al Qaeda. So I am way over time, so uh, <laughs> I apologize, but thank you. Please welcome Prof Professor Paulson. Well, yeah. She just asked if I can hold it to 20. I actually did the old professor trick and brought up the, the watch. Um, so hold me to it, OK? It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. It, it really is a pleasure. I live in Minnesota, and I know it's warm in here right now, but we had 50 days of below zero weather. And so it's nice to see some old friends, nice to, to have made some new friends, and nice to have seen some things that I haven't seen in Minnesota for like five months, like 40 degrees temperatures, sunshine, the color green. Um, and it's an honor to, to be here with such distinguished panelists. Um, my title, my talk, and there's a little handout, I think it actually made it into the folders if you haven't thrown those away yet, is Drone On, uh, which, which, which is both appropriate for a professor, and I think it telegraphs exactly what my position is. It's going to be very close to Greg Katz's position. Um, my proposition is really a simple, but I think kind of a bracing one. The President of the United States, in his capacity as military commander in chief of the nation's armed forces, in time of legally authorized war, has the plenary power and discretion under the U.S. Constitution 
to target and kill specific individuals that he legitimately determines in good faith to be active enemy combatants engaged in lawful or unlawful hostilities against the United States. Now, by active enemy combatants, I mean persons who are affiliated with an enemy force or power who have not been captured, have not surrendered, and have not laid down their arms and ceased their lawful or unlawful war-waging activities against the United States. In targeting and killing such enemy combatants, the President, as Commander-in-Chief of the military, may use any and all military means and technologies of war available to him, including the use of drone technology, without regard to whether or not international law purports to restrict or restrain such killing, and without resort to any further judicial U.S. legal process or judicial approval, whether or not the enemy combatant is a United States citizen, and regardless of where such person might be located, even on the streets of Manhattan. Okay. Now, that's a bracing proposition, but I think that each of those points is eminently legal defense, legally defensible. And uh, in setting forth this proposition, I, I, I've deliberately chosen as my paradigm case the Al Alaki case, which I think presents, in, in theory at least, the most, the hardest factual case for application of this view, and that is the targeting of a specific individual who is a United States citizen or national for killing by aerial drone attack technology by the unilateral decision of the president without any form of judicial due process or notice, irrespective of any constraints that might be thought imposed by international law. That, that is the situation of the Al Alaki case. Um, <clears throat> Al Alaki, Anwar Al Alaki, was a U.S. citizen and an Al Qaeda operational commander, as I think just about everybody concedes. My claim is that the seemingly hardest of cases is actually a very easy case for unilateral presidential power. All that is required is to think systematically about a series of discrete legal propositions. And if you accept each one as correct, and this is basically the outline of my, uh, my talk, and I recognize that not everyone will accept each of these propositions, the conclusion follows logically that targeted killing by drone of Al-Awlaki and others in similar circumstances fully complies with the U.S. Constitution. So my roadmap of questions consists of, was this a constitutionally authorized war? The answer is yes. Was Al-Awlaki a legitimate military target as an enemy combatant following within the scope of the authorization for war? The answer is yes. Is, are decisions about targeting and killing enemy combatants within the president's exclusive commander-in-chief clause power to wage and conduct war where it is authorized? The answer is yes. Is citizenship relevant? The answer is no. Is there a due process of war clause that requires further judicial authorization or some form of kill warrant? The answer is no. What is the relevance of international law? International law is primarily a political and diplomatic constraint, not in true effect a legal one. So I'll develop each of these propositions. I want to emphasize that my position is one of legal analysis, not one of uh, tactical correctness or moral correctness or anything like that. I'm basically making a legal argument. The essence of my argument is that Anwar al-Awlaki was a legitimate military target in time of a constitutionally authorized war against an enemy force or power, he being an operational commander of al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula, an entity with whom the United States is at war. My first proposition, the first step is easy. Uh, the United States is in a state of constitutionally authorized war, and al-Awlaki falls within the scope of the authorization. Some of this will duplicate what Greg Katz has said, but I want to emphasize that this falls within a, essentially a declared war. Eileen, I hate to take issue with the moderator, but she said this isn't a declared war. I would actually say that this is a declared war. It is unfashionable to declare war oh, between countries. Okay. It is unfashionable these days to formally declare war, but the authorization for use of military force of September 18th, 2001 is functionally the broadest, most sweeping and comprehensive declaration of war um, in our nation's history. It authorizes the president to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored 
such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Think about how sweeping that is, right? We declare war not necessarily on nations, but organizations and persons, persons who bear some sort of connection, including having aided organizations that were involved in some of their persons in the attacks of September 11th. There's no time limit. There's no geographic limit. It's a massive declaration of war styled as an authorization to use force. Now, I know some of the Federalist Society, and I have debated John Yu at Berkeley on some of these things, conceive of the war initiation power as being a presidential power. I'm more of the congressionalist view. I think the correct original public meaning of the declare war clause is that Congress gets to authorize the use of force and the president does not outside of certain defensive and repelling sudden attack uh, emergency situations. But whichever view you have, this clearly puts the president at the height of his war making power in terms of the scope of the authorization for use of force. My second proposition, Al-Awlaki is a legitimate target. I think this is simple. Al-Awlaki is an unlawful enemy combatant. He made the transition from radical Islamist cleric to Al-Qaeda recruiter to all the way to being a terrorist organizational commander who there is strong evidence uh, was involved in plotting and recruiting and directing certain anticipated and, and, and attempted uh, terrorist attacks against the United States. He is an enemy combatant. He is a target and he is a member of an organization that is an affiliated ally of the organization Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula is basically an Al-Qaeda franchise. Next step, is this an act, targeted drone killing, within the scope of the president's commander in chief power? Again, I think that's easy. Congress authorizes the war, but once a war is authorized, it is the president's to conduct. The commander in chief clause power is a specific affirmation that the conduct and management of war, where legally authorized, is for the commander in chief. We pick a single civilian elected commander in chief for these responsibilities, but he is then vested with the full commander in chief military power of the United States. That means all matters of choosing targets, techniques, tactics, technologies, all matters of military strategy, all matters of conduct of war, how hard to fight, where to shoot, where to stop, where to go, what to do with people when you capture them, rules of engagement. These are all commander-in-chief clause powers. So we have an authorized war, we have a legitimate military target of the enemy, and it falls within the power of the president as commander-in-chief to make the targeting decision. Next step, if you're following along at home, flip the outline to the second page. Does US citizenship make a difference? The long and short of it is not much. It is absolutely clear and has long and been consistently recognized that the war power may be employed against U.S. citizens who are engaged in war waging activities against the United States. Or put more simply, U.S. citizens can be enemy combatants. And where they are enemy combatants, they can be dealt with pursuant to the war power rather than a law enforcement power. That's the lesson most obviously of the Civil War, right? The fact that the enemy army consists entirely of persons that you rightly consider to be your citizens uh, does not mean that you cannot shoot at them. You may apply the war power to them. It might be unfashionable to say this in the South. Does, does Gainesville count as the South? But you can shoot if you're a Union soldier at Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson. You may target an enemy commander of enemy forces. That is a legitimate military target in a battlefield type situation. Now, Anwar al-Awlaki is no Robert E. Lee, but legally he is. Droning al-Awlaki is like the Union soldier taking a shot at General Lee. It is the same thing in terms of legal authority. U.S. citizens can be enemy combatants when we are in a situation of actual legal war. The fact that you might alternatively or also 
bringing in certain persons, certain charges as criminals or, or criminal charges of treason does not mean that you cannot also treat them as enemy combatants governed by the law of war. And that's the lesson also the Nazi saboteur cases, which Judge Randolph mentioned in the previous panel. Um, <clears throat> The way the Nazi saboteur cases draw the line is with a crisp distinction between enemy combatants, whether citizens or not, and non-combatants. That's the way they distinguish the old Civil War, post-Civil War era case, ex parte Milligan. You may employ the war, you may not use the, the military power, the military commission power essentially as your criminal law enforcement prosecution mechanism, but you may employ the war power against enemy unlawful combatants. The correct bright line, the right bright line, is not between citizens and non-citizens. As Justice Scalia, the patron saint of the Federalist Society, erroneously thought in his badly confused separate opinion with Justice Stevens and Hamdi, Nino, what are you thinking? If you're concurring or writing a separate opinion with John Paul Stevens, isn't there something wrong with that when those are the two? The correct distinction, the right bright line is not between citizens and non-citizens, but between combatants and non-combatants. <clears throat> you may target combatants and apply to them the war power. You may not target non-combatants and apply to them the war power. What makes the Japanese detention and internment cases so awfully wrong is that they had upheld the use of military power to restrain liberty of innocent civilian non-combatants, conceded not to be engaged in war-making activities on the basis of race. And it was just additional to boot problem that they were US citizens. Okay, now, quickly, who makes the determination as to whether a particular person, whether a particular target is an enemy combatant. Professor Flaherty wants that to be determined at some level by some sort of quasi-judicial or judicial process. I think that's exactly the wrong position. Ultimately, constitutionally, the determination of whether someone is properly subject to the war power as a targeted enemy combatant is for the president to make as commander in chief in time of authorized war. Now that is a bracing proposition, okay, and it does permit the executive to make mistakes, it does open up the possibility of abuses, but you have abuse possibilities under any system, and the Constitution vests the power and the ultimate responsibility in the President to make precisely these determinations. The President making these determinations through whatever mechanism he desires in his administration is all the due process that you need and that the Constitution even permits. Due process of law basically means in accordance with the law of the land. Here, in time of authorized war, the law of the land is the vesting of these decisions in the plenary determination and judgment of the President of the United States. It goes back to the scope of the Commander-in-Chief power. He chooses the target, the techniques, the tactics as an aspect of that power, and the courts do not properly have any power in that regard. Finally, there's the question of international law. Okay? Five years ago or so at a Federalist Society conference like this, I gave a presentation that I think I titled The Fog of International Law. Okay? Basically asking the question, what is the force of international law as a matter of US law and who gets to interpret and apply it? The short of it is, you, international law is only United States law to the extent fully consistent with the U.S. Constitution. No requirement of international law can supersede a constitutional power of the United States. So what that means is if something is otherwise within the commander-in-chief clause power of the president to do pursuant to an authorization to use force, nothing in international law actually can constrain that as a matter of U.S. law. There are a couple of other very irrelevant determinations. Can I spend like 15 seconds on each of six? Okay. There's the possibility of collateral damage. There are missed targets and the mistakes. This is true with any form of war technology. It is unfortunate. It is not unique to drones. And the problem is, as Greg Katz has said, uh, actually reduced with respect to war, uh, drones. 
Drone technology is merely a new weapon, a new way of applying the use of force. The availability of military alternatives, can we capture the guy, is a question for the commander-in-chief's military judgment in any circumstance. And then say, location, 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 as one friend put it to me, you know, if, if you can target him in Yemen, can you target them in Stockholm? Can you target them in Minneapolis? Can you target them on the streets of Brooklyn or, or Tallahassee? Or maybe Lexington, Kentucky would be the, the appropriate place to um, <clears throat> The short answer is that in principle, in legal principle, you may apply this force wherever the enemy is if you judge that appropriate as a matter of the military, political, tactical, and diplomatic circumstances. Wherever the enemy is present, you have the power to choose whether to do it. And think about it. You know, it has been more than 150 years, but you couldn't say that you can't target the British in the War of 1812 because they're on U.S. soil. And again, consider the analogy of the Civil War. The power is susceptible to abuse, as all power is, yet the power must be lodged somewhere and is lodged in the commander-in-chief in time of war. What do you do if you have a poor commander-in-chief? As we do. The short answer is we have in the president an exceedingly weak commander-in-chief which skews our emotions about all these issues but it in no way alters the existence of a constitutional power. As poor as our present commander-in-chief might be, he retains the constitutional powers as commander-in-chief to use armed force under exactly these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paulson. I know now why professors are in the academy rather than in law practice. 15 seconds. <laughs> what a bargain at, at billing rates these days. Please welcome Professor Brooks. Okay, thank you all for being here on this, in this hot room on this hot day. I feel like, uh, you know, loosen your ties, take off your jackets, pour a cup of cold water over your head. Uh, I, I know I have the great misfortune of being the only thing standing between you and alcohol at this point. Um, so I'm, oh, the Q&A also stands between you. All right, all right. Uh, no, so I'll, I'll try to uh, at least not be unduly soporific. Um, so I am a law professor, obviously, uh, but I, I want to actually, in my comments, to some extent, go back to first principles, because in addition to being a law professor, uh, I'm a defense policy person. I worked in jobs at the State Department and the Defense Department in policy positions, not law, not legal positions. Uh, and I'm also an American citizen. Uh, I'm married to an, uh, an American Army officer who's currently deployed, and I care enormously on a very personal level as a citizen and the spouse of a military officer about the issues we're talking about today. Uh, and I'm, of course, a human being, uh, and I care about the world that we live in. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Uh, and say, here we are at a moment, uh, let's see, we're almost, uh, almost 13 years after the terrorist attacks of September 11th, and we have waged the United States two very open wars uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. We're also waging what amounts to a secret war, uh, and that is the war that is mostly, not exclusively, but mostly been waged via drone strikes, also, also some special operations forces raids and so forth. Uh, and that secret war, which is officially unacknowledged by the government of the United States, uh, officially speaking, if not acknowledged in court filings, et cetera, uh, has killed an estimated 4,000 people in at least three countries, but perhaps as many as half a dozen countries uh, separated uh, geographically from each other and from the, the so-called hot battlefield conflicts of Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, how do we evaluate this, this secret conflict uh, more than a decade after the 9-11 attacks? It seems to me, and I'm going to use here a line that uh, uh, a phrase was coined by my old law professor, Harold Coe, uh, former dean of Yale Law School and best known as the former legal advisor at the State Department under President Obama. Uh, Harold Coe has a term, lawful but awful. Uh, 
He does not apply that term to this. In fact, obviously, as you all know, he has been a, a staunch defender of the uh, uh, legal right of the administration to wage this particular secret war. Um, but I think that we should think of the secret war as being in, the, in that category, as lawful but awful. And I think that's so for three very distinct reasons, uh, although they all overlap to some extent. Uh, one is I think that it is deeply offensive to core principles of American democracy, uh, in particular checks and balances. Uh, two, I think it is deeply offensive uh, and deeply undermines core rule of law norms internationally as well as domestically. Uh, and three, I think it's strategically uh, somewhere between uh, unhelpful and stupid. Um, I also think it's just plain unnecessary. So let me walk you briefly through each of those uh, arguments. Uh, number one, why do I think it offends U.S. democratic principles? Well, if I were in Congress right now, I would be hopping mad. Uh, I think that what the U.S. is doing right now, and in fact, as this has gotten much worse under President Obama than it was under President Bush, uh, has gotten very, very, very far away from what Congress contemplated in the authorization to use military force passed just a few days after the September 11, September 11 attacks. Um, the AUMF, just to refresh your memory, gave the uh, executive branch the authorization to use force against not anybody everywhere, anytime, for any reason, uh, but rather against those organizations and states that planned, authorized, committed, or aided the 9-11 attacks or harbored those who did. And it didn't give authorization to use force for any old reason, but rather to prevent future terrorism against the United States, not all future bad acts committed by anyone anywhere, uh, and to use force uh, against, by future terrorism against the United States committed by such organizations or states. Now, even in the days right after September 11th when the Pentagon and the World Trade Center were still smoldering and we're still pulling corpses out of the wreckage, uh, Congress rejected a request from the Bush administration to have a more expansive AUMF. The administration initially had proposed uh, an authorization to use force to, quote, deter and preempt any future acts of terrorism or, or aggression. But even in that moment of peak distress, panic, anxiety, and anger, Congress, I think, very rightly rejected such an open-ended AUMF, understanding full well that when Congress cedes power to the executive branch, you don't usually get it back. It doesn't come back. Um, that being said, despite that initial rejection of a more open-ended AUMF, what we've seen in the last decade plus has been a real sort of AUMF mission creep. Uh, we have increasingly used uh, lethal force outside of hot battlefields. You know, again, I'm talking not Afghanistan or Iraq but to target uh, individuals who are not apparently part of al-Qaeda. Uh, we've, we've got developed this nice new concept that's been discussed already of al-Qaeda and its associates, but that's an extremely uh, poorly defined uh, set of people. Um, so we're going after people not connected increasingly to al-Qaeda, people who had no particular connection to the 9-11 attacks, and increasingly people who don't pose in any normal understanding of the term imminent the slightest imminent threat to the United States, e.g. al-Shabaab terrorists in Somalia. Well, I'm still waiting for somebody to explain that one to me. They're, I'm sure they're bad guys. You know, I'm absolutely sure they're guys I would not like, and frankly, is the world better off without them? Probably so. But I don't think it, it I think it's, it's a huge stretch to shoehorn, uh, boy, I'm mixing my metaphors here. It's a huge stretch to shoehorn that stuff into the AOF, forgive the metaphor. Um, and Congress has let this happen, and frankly, the Democrats have been absolutely as bad as the Republicans. This is not a partisan issue, frankly, I think, at all. Uh, I think this is, this is an issue of political cowardice on the part of both parties. Um, that being said, by the way, and here I, I do differ from some of my friends in the Human Rights Committee, I think there's no question that with or without an AUMF, the President clearly has the inherent power to use force against any imminent threat to the United States, wherever it comes from, whoever it comes from. But I think that that is a power that in the United States has been, generally speaking, used rarely and wisely for truly scary threats. There are some exceptions to this wise use here. Uh, but, but it should be used very widely. It should, wisely. It should be the exception, not the norm. And what we have done is we have normalized uh, the use of force against a sort of ever-expanding and more nebulous and geographically unbounded kind of threat. 
uh, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, remember that the U.S. was actually the, the, you know, in some ways the cradle of the law of armed conflict. Remember the Lieber Code, the first written code of armed conflict during the Civil War, uh, when in uh, uh, regulation for the Union Army, uh, one of the provisions of the Lieber Code was peace is the normal condition, war is the exception. The ultimate object of all modern war is a renewed state of peace. It's really hard to see how we ever get there uh, right now. Um, and you might argue that the kinds of threats we face now just don't lend themselves to that neat distinction between war and peace, and I would in fact agree with that. But I don't think that we want to let that become a reason to throw all of our own democratic checks and balances out the window or to throw rule of law principles out the window. And I'll come back to that again in a moment. Uh, so that's, that's all I'll say on the domestic law here right now. Uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit about international law. I, I agree. I don't, I don't think this is manifestly unlawful at all. Um, I think that the U.S. interpretation of the law of armed conflict is perfectly plausible. Uh, to view, you know, the, uh, an attack that caused death and destruction on the scale of 9-11 as an act of war seems plausible to me. Uh, I can't see any logical reason why you would have to restrict an armed conflict only to states. Makes no particular sense in today's world. Um, that being said, I think it is worth keeping in mind something that was raised by a couple of people on the previous panel, which is that uh, it's not all or nothing. Uh, we didn't have to decide to call this war in order to use military force. Um, we could have used force under the international law of self-defense, using et cetera. Um, it was a choice to decide to view this as an armed conflict and al-Qaeda as a party to that conflict. And as Laura Donahue, my colleague at Georgetown, noted, uh, there are a lot of examples of governments being very hesitant to do that for fear of essentially giving a, a huge soapbox to some pretty creepy people who frankly don't deserve the prestige that you give them if you say they're a combatant in war against the big United States. Um, that being said, I think that still it was a perfectly plausible decision to say we think that the best legal framework for this is the law of armed conflict. The problem is precisely that in today's world, the nature of the threats that we face in today's security environment just don't really fit very neatly into the kind of war, not war framework, armed conflict, not armed conflict framework. Uh, and I won't belabor this because I think the point has already been made. There's no obvious spatial boundary to an armed conflict with al-Qaeda. Uh, wherever they are, presumably the armed conflict and the law of armed conflict and thus the permissive rules on the use of lethal force travel with them, which means the whole world is potentially a battlefield, kind of a scary thought. Uh, there are no temporal boundaries. Not, as I said before, it's not at all clear how you would ever end this war. So we face an indefinite period of time in which we have given, we have handed extremely permissive rules regarding the use of force to our government. Uh, there's no, it's not clear what the boundaries are between categories of persons. Who's a combatant? Who's not a combatant? Who's a civilian directly participating in hostilities? We don't have a coherent basis for evaluating any of that anymore. Uh, you can make, you know, you can come up with ideas, but frankly it's really hard to come up with a principled set of boundaries here. Um, uh, that has implications for sovereignty. It also has implications for rights, since obviously, you know, the, the, the most obvious point of all is that once you're in an armed conflict framework, lots of things that we consider immoral and indeed illegal when you're not in an armed conflict become things that we consider A, legal, and B, moral, indeed, even ethically required. Uh, you can't go out on the street and kill the next person you see because you think he's your enemy. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in an armed conflict, you pretty much can, right? Um, what we have, at the end of the day, what we now have come to is a state of affairs in which our government, this is the government of a nation that was founded on the premise that uh, all men are in, created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, including the right to life and liberty. We have now come to be a nation in which our government claims for itself the unreviewable power to kill any person anywhere on earth at any time based on criteria that are secret, based on information that is secret and has been collected and evaluated by anonymous individuals in a secret procedure. If you think this is consistent with core rule of law norms, I think you need to go back and reread the Declaration of Independence and reread centuries of legal and ethical tradition uh, that this nation was founded on. 
Now, it's true, as uh, my colleague on the panel, Professor Paulson, said, that in any system of government, abuse is possible. And you can't simply say because abuse is possible, it's wrong. But I would put it to you that in some systems, abuse is a whole lot more likely than in others. And I think when we're in that situation, we're in a situation in which the possibility for abuse has gone up quite dramatically. Uh, and this should scare us, I think, a lot. Uh, I agree that the idea of rights, the particular situation of American citizens is a red herring. Um, uh, I think that we, that yes, it is hard to define the threat that we face with tremendous specificity, but frankly, I think the downside of overly narrowly defining it is significantly less than the downsides of defining it as broadly as we have. Okay, I said third, I think this is strategically uh, somewhere between unhelpful and, and increasingly veering towards the stupid. Um, I think that we, that's for two reasons. One has to do with the precedent we're setting. Um, I think that we should not kid ourselves, that we, we look at ourselves, and I, I indeed I look at my colleagues in, in the military and DOD and the intelligence community, and I think they're good people, and I do trust them. Um, I don't actually trust Vladimir Putin. Uh, there are a lot of other people in the world I don't trust at all. Uh, and we have essentially handed repressive regimes and unscrupulous regimes everywhere a playbook for how to violate sovereignty and literally get away with murder. We should not kid ourselves that the legal arguments that we make will not come back and hit us. And here I'll, I'll quote Vladimir Putin. Uh, in, in a context uh, slightly different, but, but not wholly unrelated. Back when the U.S. recognized the unilateral uh, Declaration of Independence made by Kosovo, and you should be thinking Ukraine, right? Um, Putin was very upset, and he said, uh, this decision by the United States to disregard this, what they, the Russians saw as the sovereignty of Serbia threatens to, quote, blow, a heart, the, blow apart the whole system of international relations. Those who have made this decision to recognize Kosovo should understand that it is a two-sided stick and the second end will come back and hit them in the face. That will happen with our legal arguments on targeted killings. No question about it. And we need to ask ourselves if we want to live in that world. And that, frankly, is a policy question, not fundamentally a legal question. Um, the other reason I think this, we should question this strategically, and this is, again, this is not really me. I'll, I'll quote another of my favorite people. Now I've gotten through Vladimir Putin. I'll quote Donald Rumsfeld, uh, Secretary of Defense under Bush, uh, who famously asked in the context of the Iraq War, are we creating new terrorists faster than we can kill them? And I think that is the profound strategic question that we need to ask about the U.S. targeted killing program and the secret war we are waging. It's hard to evaluate that, frankly. It is very hard to evaluate that, but I think that there is quite good reason to begin to wonder if we are, in fact, making our problems worse. But again, don't take my word for it. Uh, uh, General Stanley McChrystal, uh, General James Cartwright, uh, Admiral Dennis Blair, quite a lot of quite senior military and intelligence officials have raised the same question uh, that I'm raising here. Uh, Al-Qaeda Central is no longer the threat it used to be. On the other hand, we now face increasingly a decentralized, non-hierarchical, amorphous threat. It's not particularly clear that our current method of going after them is, is likely to be at all successful. So let me conclude here. I, I said that I think that the U.S. targeted killing program, uh, and again, I also agree, drones are not the issue here. It's just another, it's just another weapons delivery platform. Um, is lawful but awful. Uh, I, you know, it's no question about it. And I, again, I, uh, Professor Paulson noted, if you accept each in a series of perfectly plausible legal propositions, you come to the conclusion that this is legal. I think that's right. I also think that if a series of plausible uh, legal propositions lead you to a situation in which we are so profoundly undermining any rule of law norms, uh, then it's time to start saying, maybe we've got a problem with our legal framework. You know, maybe it is not doing the work we want it to do, which is draw some coherent lines so that the state use of lethal force is not entirely unbounded, which is what it is becoming. Uh, I, I also think that uh, we can do better than this. Uh, I think a number of people have noted that we certainly could have a good deal more transparency and accountability than we currently have. Uh, I don't think, I think that's hard, but certainly far from impossible. Uh, I think that uh, we 
we don't need to fall victim to the idea that there, there's, this, there's this false choice that gets set up, that we either have to have what we have now, unbounded power, or you can't do anything. And I think that's just plain silly, and we need to reject that out of hand. Uh, if, if, it, if war, nothing, if war crime is the choice, then yeah, maybe you say, gosh, maybe war is better. But I don't think that is the choice. You know, the Geneva Conventions and indeed our own laws were not handed down by a divine power. You know, humans create these, humans can change these. If we need a different legal framework that does a better job of imposing some meaningful constraints on the state use of lethal force while simultaneously recognizing a type of threat that we have not seen before. Uh, if that's what we need, I think we're smart enough collectively to come up with something that does a little bit of a better job than this. Um, we also, of course, as I said, always have, as, as a nation and the executive branch has the power in a true emergency, we find out that a heretofore unheard of terrorist group, religious cult, you name it, state, has nuclear weapons, of course we can act. You don't need the aid. You don't need any of this to act in a true emergency. The trick is how do we prevent the exceptional from swallowing up the norm altogether? And let me finally end with just a plea to keep this in some perspective. This is the nation that, in, this is a nation in which we had pioneers cross the Rocky Mountains. Uh, we are supposed to be a nation of uh, courageous settlers who face down any threat in order to be true to our own beliefs and in order to form this nation that we all love so much and so many of us fight to defend. Uh, I think we've become a nation of wimps, quite frankly. Uh, when you look at the death toll from America's previous wars, uh, the Civil War killed more than 600,000 Americans. World War II killed more than 400,000 Americans, if you adjust for population size. These were horrific, horrific conflicts. And yet we didn't think that we needed to give the executive branch wholesale authorization uh, to use force against anyone, anywhere, anytime, uh, permanently, with no possibility of reining that in and no spatial or temporal limitations. Uh, today, terrorism is a real threat. You know, I worry about it. Uh, I worry about terrorists and a whole lot of other people getting a hold of weapons of mass destruction in particular. Uh, it is scary. On the other hand, uh, in terms, there has been no year except 2001 in which terrorism has killed more American citizens uh, than lightning strikes. Uh, you are 12 times more likely to suffocate accidentally in your own bed than you are to be killed by terrorism. And again, that doesn't mean you can dismiss it. Uh, but if the threat is a, an unusual and exceptional threat, let's reserve that for the use of exceptional powers when the threat with some specificity can actually be identified. Uh, if we want to toss out 200 plus years of American commitment to democratic checks and balances and the rule of law, are we really going to do it for this? Thank you so much, panelists. As you can tell, they prepared quite a bit. We had originally <laughs> intended to uh, have, have shorter comments, but as I was sitting here watching the pages turn, uh, I, I didn't start nagging them early on because it always looked like they were on the last page. So I thought, well, they're about to finish. So we have just under 10 minutes left for questions. Please come to the microphones. And while you're doing that and formulating your difficult questions, I'd like the panelists to engage each other because I did notice as each panelist was talking, other panelists were scribbling furiously. So who would like to start? Greg? I'm fine. Oh, oh no? Professor Flaherty? I've spoken too much. Okay. So. I'll, let's get the question. Yeah. You, guys, you guys can prompt the agenda. Okay, all right, come along. Uh, Professor Brooks mentioned uh, the Lieber Code that was issued to uh, the Union Army during the Civil War, and Professor Paulson said, yes, the Civil War, that really shows it. But I, I just happened to have looked at the Lieber Code just a few days ago, and it has a specific provision saying assassination is unlawful, and I believe Professor Lieber put it there because uh, he saw it in Vattel and probably in Halleck's treatise that there was this traditional doctrine, assassination is not a legitimate tactic of war. And just um, if I could just give this one last little twist. 
uh, in April of 1865, when President Lincoln was assassinated, and everybody in the North was outraged, uh, their outrage wasn't that the assassin was some guy acting alone. It was rather that they took for granted that he was a Confederate agent. And they said, this is monstrous. War is one thing. Assassination, that is, that is a war crime. Is this directed at any one person? It's particularly at Professor Paulson and per, um, Mr. Katzis. How do you reconcile this history in which we said, no, assassination is wrong, that's not a legitimate tactic of war, with your current positions, which is, hey, we're at war, we can just kill anyone at any time. Why isn't that assassination? We've got quite uh, a few <clears throat> questions. Okay. Be brief, brief if you great, can. Great question. Um, <clears throat> the word assassination is used in the Lieber Code does not correspond to how we think of it today. Um, <clears throat> I think that even consistent with the Lieber Code, you may target the commander of enemy forces. When Lincoln was touring Virginia, his people were rightly concerned that he would be a legitimate military target for snipers. The assassination of Lincoln by Booth was by a classic unlawful combatant after the termination of hostilities acting uh, surreptitiously. <clears throat> he's your, he's your Queer in Nazi saboteur and spy, and he would be treated the same way as a Nazi saboteur as well. Thank you. Uh, can I, can I just, uh, very briefly, we have quite a few people lined up in just a couple minutes. All right, uh, Paul Harrison from Seattle University. Uh, this question is for uh, Professor Paulson. Um, I pretty much agree with almost every point, except for number two, where we talked about uh, Anwar al Wallaki, and that's an easy case, in my opinion, because no one would really disagree that he's an enemy combatant, but my concern, and I think the main concern with this issue, the due process issue, is how do we know, what evidence did we have for the next person that they're an enemy combatant? Uh, who determines it, and is there a concern that if this is all secretive, that maybe they're using illegitimate reasons and speculative evidence to prove that? Uh, yeah, I think that is a legitimate concern, and that's why you need to have a reliable commander-in-chief in whom you vest these powers. I mean, at any level, <clears throat> any sort of decision-making is going to be made by someone as to who the target is. It can be used, it, that, that power can be used for good, it can be used for ill. Um, for better or worse, I think that constitutionally that power is vested in the president as military commander-in-chief, and he may use it for good or for ill. This is a reason to have uh, a good person in that uh, situation because it is a fearsome and formidable and potentially dangerous power and you don't want it vested in an unsafe set of hands. Professor uh, uh, Brooks, you want to speak to that? My, my concern is if, if my, uh, my right not to be killed by my government depends on the president being a, a good person. Uh, I don't feel that great about that. Um, and, and, you know, th this links back to the earlier question about, about assassinations. And, and in 1976, um, uh, Chilean government intelligence uh, operatives uh, killed uh, former Chilean defense minister Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C., uh, and also his American research assistant by planting a, a car bomb under his car and it exploded, it, it killed, killed two people, badly injured one other American. Um, and we, we promptly, the United States, denounced this as unlawful. Um, of course, this was in the context of uh, what the Pinochet regime in Chile viewed as a war, a war against subversion, a war against uh, insurgents, a war against communists. And I don't have the slightest doubt that if that situation were to arise today, that they would simply say precisely what we say. They would say, look, we're in an armed conflict. We're in a civil war, frankly. It's a lot worse than what you Americans have with terrorism. We're in an armed conflict, and uh, he was an unlawful enemy combatant. Uh, and you want our evidence? Well, we can't tell you it's secret. You want our legal criteria? We can't tell you it's secret. Um, but trust us. And I'm, I don't think we would take all that kindly to that. I completely agree. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Tony Bush from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, my question is for anyone who wants to tackle it. Uh, you all acknowledged, I think, that, that the AUMF uh, imposes no spatial limitations, uh, no geographical limitations. Uh, my question is to the extent, um, what to, what, to what extent uh, may the executive, um, uh, the military perhaps, 
undertake uh, operations under the AUMF online on the internet. Um, and, and, and if you speak to counterterrorism uh, professionals, they'll often tell you that, that our biggest gap is ideological. We can go after as many people as we want, but bridging that gap, the ideological gap, is very difficult. Thinking hypothetically, potentially, you know, would, would we be authorized to go online and counter this propaganda? Uh, would we be authorized to do so covert, covertly? Let's, and, let's, and let's start. Is, is that your question? That's my question. Thank you. Takers? Um, I'm looking at Christian here, who recalls from the Defense Department that we, this issue was a, a hot issue. Um, and several people noted the strange irony that uh, <coughs> there were fewer uh, legal constraints if you wanted to kill a suspected terrorist than if you wanted to um, do something that might be construed by others as uh, libelous uh, on the Internet with regard to same said suspected terrorist. Um, uh, I, I, I do think that cyber and Internet issues present are, are, are legally tricky and you can't, there, there's some real dangers of adding that into our war and armed conflict basket. Um, so I don't, I don't know that the fact, I, I don't know that the, the answer to that dilemma should be let's make it just as easy to take action in cyberspace. That, that being said, I do think we have some slightly, slightly convoluted uh, uh, legal barriers to acting as freely as we might wish to do in the internet domain that do need to be looked at pretty closely. I'm not an expert in that, so I'll, I'll stop right there. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jennifer Dreyer with Florida State University College of Law. Um, my question is looking for an answer both with domestic law as well as international law. Why not pursue treason when it comes to U.S. citizens, like with the El Awaki case? Um, is it simply a matter of extraterritoriality and worried about not being able to get extradition, not having enough diplomatic ties, or you know, why not pursue uh, treason as opposed to a drone strike? Because you can't get them. <laughs> Any others? Mm, right. Yes, sir. From Thomas Moody, University of Florida. Uh, with technological advances, I think it's plausible that one day we will be able to deliver drone strikes that uh, yield zero collateral damage. If we achieve that goal, will any of your opinions change? I mean, I think there's apparent consensus on the panel that, that uh, the problem is not with drones as a weapons delivery system per se. I mean, there is some factual uh, dispute about how much collateral damage there has been. There's a dispute on that, which might give rise to an inference that there haven't been reasonable precautions taken to make sure civilians aren't hit, which is the international standard. But I think most of our concerns are about the power in an unfettered executive branch. And, you know, the one thing I would say to that, to echo what, uh, what Rosa is saying, is that this is precisely the situation that the founders feared. They thought that you could not rely on good people being in charge of government. You know, government was not something that angels would always run. It was precisely for that reason that they were the pioneers. In fact, they pretty much invented the modern system of separation of powers. And, um, you know, I won't take your time since I've already taken up so much of your time, but of Professor Paulson's six premises, I would say at least three of them are fundamentally flawed as a matter of original understanding, history, <laughs> and uh, precedent. Um, but it can't be right that, you know, the president could have killed all of the Japanese Americans if he thought they were, you know, uh, a threat during World War II. But that, it's those kinds of conclusions that should lead you to work backwards and question the premises that lead you to that kind of result. Well, let me, so, I, I, so. I, let me just jump in for you first. Yeah, I didn't say the president could have killed all the Japanese Americans. Why not? Where, where are you coming could, up with that? He could target them. You just said the president yes. has unilateral control to target anyone who, as commander in chief, he feels is a threat to the country to target in time of war. Combatants. Again, combatants. Well, I think we've identified well, all the problems. He determines they're combatants, and it's unreviewable. So there's nothing, there's no check on the president's ability to make that determination. That's your position, right? I, <laughs> I, I, mean, I the, hate the to checks. end this, but I've been asked to end properly at 5.30, and we're a couple minutes over. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank our panelists. <laughs> we agree to disagree.